So the next instruction we're going to look at is a compare and swap. So the compare and swap is a slightly more generic instruction than sim a simple test and set. So it's compare and swap, you have a location, it's got some value v. You read the location and check if the value is v. If it's equal to v, then you write a new value n. If it's not equal to v, then let's say it's equal to v prime, then you just leave the value as it is. So it's a little bit more generic than a compare and swap, and so you can write any value to a location if you test if the test returns true. If the test returns false, then um, you report the result and you just uh, you just leave the memory location as it is. That is, you don't change it, and you test the value. The only check that's allowed is you test the value against a constant. So test and set is really a special case of the compare and swap. Okay, and there are lots of different variants of this. So maybe you don't want to swap in n, but you just want to swap in uh, n plus 1, right? So the new value is n plus 1. Um, that is an ex example of a locked increment. If you want n minus 1, that's a locked decrement. Uh, PowerPC and Alpha provide a slightly different variant of this, known as a load-linked uh, store conditional as well, which is also a form of an atomic read modifier, right? Okay. So... Now we're going to take a look at simple Boolean uh, spin locks implemented using uh, test and set. And we look at the performance characteristics, uh, when they do well, when they don't, uh, how can we improve them. So let's look at what a Boolean spin lock is. It's the simplest lock uh, implementation. It's got simply two states, Boolean states, lock and unlock. Uh, you can use different representations. Let's just call the lock as a 1 and the unlocked as a 0. Uh, when locked, you atomically transition from unlocked to locked. So if it's locked, unlocked. When locked, uh, you keep checking until the lock is unlocked. So you keep spinning until at some point the lock becomes unlocked and then you break out. So if it's unlocked, um, you break out of the. So if it's. So you keep spinning until the lock is. Um, you keep spinning if the lock is a 1, and if the lock becomes 0, you break out. Okay. Uh, busy waiting versus blocking. In a multi-core, normally you busy wait for another thread to release the lock. Why? Because it's likely to happen soon, assuming that critical sections are small. The critical sections are large um, because that's the way you wrote the program. That's bad practice, right? Because then you just you're going to be you're going to have only as much parallelism as your critical section permits. So you're not going to have a lot of parallelism, then your program's going to be slower, it's not really going to make use of your multi-core, and can't really do much about it. And if you have a multi-core processor, then it's probably you know, likely that it's not going to be useful for anything else anyway, because your program is already trying to maximize and use all the processors possible. Uh, in a single processor, if trying to acquire a health lock is blocked, the only sensible option. So if you have a multi-core, you busy wait, right? If you have a single processor, then the only sensible option is context switch. Because if you need the other person to run in order for the person to release the lock, right? So if you don't get the lock, you can't make progress. And if you've got the CPU, then the person who actually has the lock can't make progress. So in order for the person who's got the lock to make progress, you got to tell the OS that uh, you didn't get the lock and that you want to context switch out. Um, and the OS, somewhat, you can you have improvised versions where the OS kind of knows not to reschedule this thread until it knows that the lock is released. So the OS has to kind of have some notion of understanding of who has the lock and what does the lock even mean. Um, Blocking has high overhead because it involves an operating system call. So typically, let's say a lock acquire a release, even in the worst case, um, assuming that it's free, it's going to cost you a couple of hundred cycles, uh, which is about 0.1 milliseconds. Right? And if you have an OS operating system call, that normally runs into um, quite a, uh, a millisecond or so. You at least lock it 10 times higher overhead. Um, so in my opinion, it rarely makes sense in multi-core paddle programs, uh, but you may have specific uh, conditions like in web server or systems where the number of threads is significantly higher and you may want to just do simple blocking. So 
Another way of implementing locks is using interrupts enable and disable. Uh, we'll look at how to do that. So the general idea is that what we want to do is build multi-instruction atomic ops. Okay? The OS dispatcher gets control in two ways. Internal is if the thread does something to relinquish the CPU, like an I.O. call. Right? So an example of an internal one would be I.O. And an external one would be a timer. Right? So an external timer kicks in, the scheduler kicks in, and then it uh, blocked the thread halfway through what it was doing. Right? And a uniprocessor essentially can avoid context switching by avoiding internal events and preventing its external events from happening. That is, you don't do any I.O. or any operations in the section that you want to be atomic. So if you want an atomic section, you don't have any internal events. And the external events, the OS um, tries to keep out of your way until absolutely the, it has to uh, kick in because you want it to kick in. Uh, consequently, a naive implementation of locks would be to essentially disable and enable interrupts. Right. So if you have a lock acquired, just disable the interrupts, uh, no internal event can happen, your critical section has no internal events, hence um, it can't get switched out at that point because of that. And so now you have an atomic section implemented. Right. The big challenge is, is that one, you can't let the user do this because think of the following, you have a lock acquired and then an infinite loop. Right. Now you've essentially locked down the system forever. Right. So you can't have the user do this. Um, again, in real-time system, there's no guarantees on timing. Critical sections can be arbitrarily long. So if you have one application runs for a really long time in its critical section, then essentially it's blocked out other applications from even getting any CPU time. So one application essentially is monopolizing the whole CPU, throws all your fairness scheduling and all of that out of whack. A uh, better implementation of locks by disabling interrupts is essentially key idea is maintain a lock variable, right? So if you have a lock variable, uh, then you only need to ensure that the interrupts are disabled um, when acquiring and releasing the lock. So when you manipulate the variable, so if the value is busy, uh, put the thread to sleep, uh, put, put the thread on a wait queue, go to sleep, you enable interrupts, uh, else value is busy, and you, you enable interrupts either way. Right? So only when you acquire or release the lock do you enable the interrupts. Um, similarly, when you release the lo lock, you also need to disable interrupts. So this ensures that the operation on the lock variable itself is atomic. And you know, if the operation on the lock is atomic, then we know how to construct atomic sections essentially with mutual exclusion. Right? So this essentially removes the need for implementing a lock instruction. Obviously, this is going to be a pretty expensive process because one, disabling interrupts is significantly more expensive than if you had an atomic instruction. You know, that's a couple of hundred cycles at the worst case. Disabling interrupts requires you to uh, go through multiple levels in not just the software stack, but also the hardware stack. Uh, and so this is going to run into a few milliseconds, if not more. And so if you have a short critical section that all it does is increment a counter, for example, then this is going to be pretty bad. So let's just try to take a look at this new um, lock implementation, right? So why do we need to disable interrupts? One, uh, it avoids interruption between checking and setting the lock value. Otherwise, two threads could think that they've got the lock value, right? And so essentially, you've taken a critical section and said, all I need to do is make my, I don't need arbitrary program critical sections uh, to have their interrupts disabled. All I need to do is implement a lock variable uh, during which the interrupts are disabled. And unlike the previous uh, solution we spoke about, uh, the acquired releases are pretty short. Because all you're doing in them is manipulating the lock variable. Okay. Uh, so one of the interesting questions is uh, when do you um, enable interrupts? Right? You enable them uh, before you put the thread on the weight queue, uh, then the manipulation of the weight queue itself is non-atomic, interrupt it before going to sleep, because once you go to sleep, then how do you enable the interrupts, or do you enable it after you go to sleep? Um, so at what point do you enable the interrupts? Um, so the, the, the hard part about this is if you put, so considering these different points, if you put it, if you enable interrupts before putting the thread on the weight queue, 
the release can check the queue and not wake up the thread, right? So what if you missed um, a release? So it's possible that you tried acquiring it, the lock was busy at that if statement, right? And then you went on the thread queue. But before you went on thread queue, enable the interrupts. Okay, so you're not there in the thread queue yet. Okay, and then someone releases the lock. And then you get into the thread queue. Now you never saw the lock release. 